Amen. Thank you, Nathan. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome. My name's Eric Henderson. I'm a senior associate pastor here at Green Lake. It's a privilege uh, to be with you this morning. I want to welcome those of you across the street in the chapel. Also, those of you online thinking about clicking over to the Seahawks game in about 11 minutes. Uh, so we'll see. Let's see if we can hold on to them. Uh, hey, let me uh, pray for us as we enter uh, into this time together. God, we thank you uh, for meeting us here. God, we're grateful to be your children. We're grateful to be uh, in a community together. Would we never take for granted the gift that it is uh, to worship uh, with one another and to open the scriptures together. We pray that um, you would form faith in us, that you would build us as your people in this time. Oh, Lord, we love you. In your name, amen. Well, I gotta say, this was a hard, uh, hard sermon to write this week. A lot of, uh, lot of distractions. Uh, I don't know if you got Disney Plus, <laughs> but I did. Uh, so I'm not sure if, uh, yeah. I have young kids. I have young kids, so I have the excuse. Uh, but if you don't know what Disney Plus is, it's Disney's new streaming service. The streaming services are the new black, like everybody's got to have one. I'm thinking about doing my own. So <laughs> if you have ideas for what kind of content you'd want from me on the daily, just let me know. Uh, but it's a trip down memory lane. They've got all the old stuff. Disney's opened the vault, as they say. New Star Wars show, The Mandalorian. No spoilers, but... Pretty exciting. So needless to say, uh, it's been a nice little gift for me ahead at the beginning of this holiday season. I think many of us would agree that it's too early for Christmas, uh, but it doesn't. Okay, here we go. This is nice. We've got some chatter. Let's, the 8 a.m. service was a little, little quiet, uh, but feel free, just shout it out. Uh, and... Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's a great gift early in the holiday season. Uh, it's too early for Christmas, like I said. We got to know from over here. But it's never too early for gifts. I love gifts. And so I've always kind of, when I know gifts are coming, like I get pretty excited. When I was uh, 15, I knew that I was getting, or I was pretty sure I was getting a new guitar for Christmas. Uh, and so I just went on a hunt around uh, the house to kind of see, like, maybe, maybe there's a guitar here somewhere. So I found it really not hidden very well in mom and dad's closet where gifts get hidden. And so I think I found it, like, right after Thanksgiving, and I played that thing for, like, a month, anytime, anytime. This is my, these are my confessions, uh, if you would just receive it uh, and just really enjoyed it. So when I know gifts are coming, like, I get... Um, Pretty, pretty excited. And I hear people say all the time, like the more, the older you get, the more you realize that, you know, it's, it's not about the gifts, it's about the, the people you share them with and things like that, yada, yada, yada. I, I say bring on the gifts. Uh, I'm not that old. Ho Hobby Lobby can keep their signs. Uh, but I love gifts. And to be fair, I love giving gifts as well. Um, though it's true, I do a lot of like one for you, one for me <laughs> gifts. Like, Nathan, I bought us these matching shoes or whatever. That, we don't have matching shoes, but we should, we should consider it. Uh, and I'll tell you, some of the best gifts I've ever received were from myself. Uh, <laughs> while I was shopping for someone else. They didn't have what I was looking for, but look what they had for me. Uh, anybody who's with me, this is a safe space. Okay. For those online, like half the people, if you're still with us, half the people raise their hands. The rest of you, I can feel your judgment. <laughs> but if I'm honest, part of why I love giving and receiving gifts is I love the distraction um, that they are. And, and I love distractions probably more than I love gifts. Uh, because uh, life is hard, and there's times where, like, we just want to kind of numb the challenge of, of the moment. Uh, life can be stressful. Mondays are hard. I feel like we should all get gifts just for getting through Monday. Wednesdays are hard, oddly. Uh, weekends, 
And then vacations are super uh, exhausting, aren't they? Like, why bother? You need a vacation when you get back from the vacation to recover from the vacation. It leaves me kind of wondering, what is wrong? What's wrong with us? Uh, and and I, I don't think uh, that there's actually anything wrong with us, but clearly uh, something is wrong. I find myself wanting a break from reality, and, and the reality is, is that while nothing is wrong with, with me or you or us, something is, is clearly not right. We are too often worried, stressed out, anxious uh, people. Did you know that the United States is now the most anxious nation in the world? Congratulations. Uh, this is according to the National Institute of Mental Health. They say that stress-related ailments cost the nation $300 billion every year in medical bills and lost productivity, and our usage of sedative drugs keeps skyrocketing. Between 97 and 2004, which is a long time ago, Americans more than doubled our spending uh, on anti-anxiety medications, going from $900, billion to two point, or $900 million to $2.1 billion. Another study indicated that, that each generation in the 20th century were three times more likely than the previous generation to experience anxiety or depression. And even though our cars are safer, our, our food and water are safer, and we don't live in the danger of, of imminent attack, and our economy is stronger than many other nations, we're leading the pack when it comes to worry. In fact, other nations experience one-fifth the amount of anxiety that Americans feel. Now today, you or I may be worried uh, uh, about the economy, politics, climate change, loss of community, no longer feeling good about or safe in our our own bodies. Maybe we're worried about our our loneliness or we're worried about our children. Uh, From low-grade anxiety that most Americans feel to, to diagnose disorders or conditions, the U.S. is the world's undisputed worry champion. So you're not alone. And let me pause to say this. This message today is not uh, medical advice. Trust your doctor. Get the prescription. Get the help that you need. We're not anti-science. We're not anti-modern medicine here. The church has often been. uh, We know that God can heal and God can use uh, medicine. And I kind of went back and forth on whether to kind of give you a window into to how, I've, uh, how I've experienced this. I think for a long time, uh, I wasn't quite sure, like I'd have friends that, you know, experience some forms of anxiety or panic attacks or things. And I'd identify some social stressor in their life, like, well, you need to stop playing video games, or you need to go outside, or you need to talk to more people or eat better food. And I think we all do that. But I had an experience with uh, with, with uh, a panic attack and anxiety when I was traveling uh, last winter on sabbatical. Uh, I, was, I was traveling alone for a few days and knew that I was going to be. Uh, and I found myself uh, feeling and experiencing things I'd never experienced before. I'd been alone for several hours. I ended up in an Airbnb that felt kind of weird. Uh, my, I felt a weight upon me. Uh, I was out of breath. Uh, I was going into kind of fight or flight mode. Uh, my wife had to talk me out of, you know, woken up in the middle of the night from, from just going back to the airport and just buying a ticket home and bailing on the whole trip uh, because uh, of how I felt. And I really struggled with it and I had never experienced before. And the Lord said like, do you understand this is what some people experience in the run of their daily life? Now for me, I think it was a deadly kind of mix of a, 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 a really wicked mix of jet lag Uh, and loneliness and having nobody around me, nobody needed me. There was nothing familiar about where I was. Uh, But for some of you in this room or even online, uh, this is a daily reality. Uh, and, the, and what I want to affirm today is the testimony of Scripture and I think the words of Jesus himself uh, let us know that the world we live in is an anxious world. And each of us are experiencing things uh, in, in, in different ways. Uh, and, and we're often left with this, with this question of uh, what, am, what am I doing wrong? A, 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 am I doing enough? We're in search for peace more than, more than momentary distractions, even the fun ones. We want relief from the pressure. Maybe you feel this at work uh, while you're looking for a job. Maybe you feel this at home. Uh, maybe you feel this when you look at your, your bank account or your retirement account. You feel this when you think about Thanksgiving. What do I have to do to not feel this way? Lord, help me. Give me uh, a sense of relief. We're chasing peace and it's stressful. 
But if we're honest, I think our efforts are in fits and starts. We, we focus for a time and then distraction comes and then we focus and then distraction comes. We need a better way. And, the, and the, the question for me arises is, what agenda am I pursuing? What's my end goal? It, it, is it a happy life? Is it my own fulfillment? It, is peace even possible when I'm pursuing my own comfort? It, it's a moving target if you feel how I feel and the way that I feel about my life and my circumstances constantly changes. And I find myself in need of a new consistent reference point. And each of the disciples met Jesus in the course of their daily lives and their reference point changed. In Matthew 4, we have the story of Jesus calling his first disciples. It says this, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. These guys were fishermen. They would go and fish and their success was based on catching fish. This was their livelihood. And along comes Jesus and there was a new plan and it was to follow him. And the fish were people. The reference point changed. The way became Jesus and his agenda. And the search for peace and a new reference point as we pursue it, isn't exclusive to followers of Jesus. In fact, this message today is the last in our portrait series, uh, which is a series where each week we've addressed a distortion uh, to the image of Jesus because we've had this collective feeling that Jesus has been misrepresented, misunderstood, and often by the very people charged with presenting him to the world. That's us, the church. And the world around us is asking, is a life of faith a path to peace. I mean, I, I can imagine people saying, I don't know Jesus, but I know the church. And, and, and they seem to be just as stressed out as the rest of us. Same problems, if not more so. And they're against a whole lot of things. And that doesn't seem like a path to peace. And then those of us inside the church uh, are often disillusioned because we were taught or somehow came to expect that following Jesus would shield us from so many of the problems that we face. And if that expectation hasn't been completely shattered for you, I would encourage you, if you haven't seen all of our portrait videos, uh, they're on our Bethany's uh, YouTube channel. These are videos where folks from Bethany have courageously shared about uh, losses that they've experienced, of loved ones, of diagnoses and long recoveries, of life-altering circumstances. But most importantly, like the character Job in the Bible, they, they share insights into the God who is with them in their pain and the beauty and the wonder on the far side of their suffering. And a life of faith doesn't shield us from the problems of a broken world. But I wanna help us see together today, and this is our thesis, it's in your bulletin if you got one when you came in. I wanna help us see that in an anxious world, in a, in a broken, chaotic, and stressful world, that seeking God's kingdom is the way we truly receive the peace God gives. Now, in case you fall asleep or the fire alarm goes off and we gotta run out of here, or in case some of those online at 10.03 are still with us, let me give you the sermon in a sentence. The world wants us to trade our fear for facts, and Jesus wants us to trade our fear for faith. The world wants us to trade our fear for facts, for certainty. Jesus wants us to trade our fear for faith. When we choose to follow Jesus, we choose a different way. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of people. In our search for peace, Jesus is offering us a new reference point, a peace plan, as I've titled our message today. And we receive it by unwrapping three gifts seen in the passages that Nathan read for us. And these gifts are more than mere distractions. These are an invitation to more than just a quick fix solution. Rather, this isn't calling into an entirely new and refreshing paradigm of being in the world. What C.S. Lewis would call further up and further in, into the kingdom of God. And the good news is that all we need to do is to open our hands and receive. That these are the free gifts of God. 
We're gonna unwrap these together. It's the advocate, Jesus' peace, and friendship. Again, these are in your bulletin you got on the way in. You can open your Bibles to John 14 and flip between 14 and 15 with me, or they'll also be uh, on the screen. But let's look at this first gift from Jesus, the advocate, the Holy Spirit. John chapters 13 to 17, where our text is is found, is often called the farewell discourse. Uh, And Jesus is preparing for his his death, his resurrection, his return to the Father, and he shares a meal with his disciples. He washes their feet, he predicts his betrayal, and he talks with uh, them about preparing a place for them where he is going. They're filled with questions as Jesus goes on. I could just imagine more and more questions. If you go back and read this text, it's question after question. And and Jesus answers, as they sometimes do on the surface, uh, often responding with a question. They they serve to maybe confuse and create a bit more worry. Now, when I'm preparing for a trip, my kids are uh, eight and four, and they see the suitcase like come out of the downstairs closet, and they are immediately filled with questions. Where are you going? How long are you going to be there? Who's going to watch us? Now, they're usually concerned until this question comes into their mind, and this question is usually filled with uh, a little bit of a grin and kind of hopeful joy, and they say, this is exactly how they'll say it. They're probably watching online. They'll say, wait, what are you going to bring back for us? (laughs) And that's my ace in the hole, because my kids love gifts as much as I love gifts. But Jesus, on the other hand, doesn't do much to calm uh, the disciples' fears. And he says things like, don't worry, I won't leave you as orphans. And they're like, whoa, whoa, who said anything about, well, Jesus, this is not super comforting. But then Jesus ends this back and forth, and he begins to talk about this first gift. Let's look at it in verse 25 and 26 of chapter 14. All this I have spoken to you while with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. So Jesus' first parting gift is an advocate, also called a comforter, helper, or counselor. The Greek word here is parakletos. And in verse 16, Jesus says another parakletos will be given, uh, which lets us know that Jesus is also this same type of advocate. But what Jesus is promising them is that in his absence next to them uh, will come his spirit within them. In fact, Jesus says in John 16 that it's better for the disciples if he leaves because if he doesn't, this advocate, the Holy Spirit, won't come. And the advocate comes to do two things, as the scripture says, to teach and to remind. So we'll consider these uh, together. Jesus said the advocate will come to teach us all things. Now, the disciples aren't really putting together that the adventure is about to begin, that life as they know it, following Jesus, literally being covered uh, in in the dust from his sandals as they followed behind him, that life is gonna take on a new form, that Jesus next to them would be replaced with Jesus inside them, and this would inform and empower them in every season and situation that they would encounter. And we've all experienced this dissonance of not really uh, understanding the words uh, that are being said to us. We've all experienced this the the first time we we did something by ourselves, a sense of loss that that a loved one taught us. Maybe cast your minds to the the first time you rode a bike and and, and their hand was no longer uh, on the seat to kind of hold you in place from falling. Or, 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 or maybe this year is the first time you'll make that special holiday dessert without the loved one who taught you uh, how to make it. The, the sense of loss, the worry, doesn't just come because it's time to do it by yourself. Rather, the sense of loss comes because you so enjoyed doing it together and just didn't want to do it alone. And here's Jesus continuing to talk about his leaving and, and where he's going and he's preparing a place. And you can't come now, but you can come later. And Jesus is saying, I hear you, but it's better this way. I'm going to be closer to you than ever before. And this new advocate, this Holy Spirit is not limited by time and space, by the constraints of humanity like you and I are. The Holy Spirit is within us to teach us all things. 
And so no matter what our what present or, or, or future worry or scenario that our, that our minds can cook up, we can imagine the best possible outcome because the advocate is within us. Now we thought Alexa was helpful. Now we've been gifted the Holy Spirit to be with us and teach us all things. But not only that, Jesus promises a second function of the Holy Spirit, and this is to remind us of everything that Jesus has said to us. My wife and daughter were preparing to go on a, on a kind of extended weekend trip recently, and so me and our four-year-old were gonna be at home together. And so my wife began telling me things that I would need to know when they were gone a few days early. And, uh, you know, there's some pickups here at this place and this time, and here's a phone number, and I'm, the whole time, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this info would often come uh, a little out of time during the run of the day while, while we were cooking dinner, during a commercial and a show we were watching, uh, in a text while she was thinking about it. And I'll be honest, I was never really uh, listening. Uh, and my wife knows me enough to know that this is the case. She knows she's going to say it several times and then eventually write it down and text me in real time while she's gone uh, to remind me. And maybe you've encountered a situation like this. Maybe uh, at work you're preparing to leave for vacation and so you're telling your coworkers all the things they need to know. The subtext is, don't call me, don't text me, let me be gone, I'm telling you what you need to know now. Uh, or maybe you've been on one of those teams and likewise, you're not really taking the information in. You're thinking about when the boss is gone, like uh, we can relax a little bit. You're sure that it'll all work out. Now in this farewell discourse, Jesus was doing a lot of instructing. All the while, the disciples were not getting it. But most importantly, Jesus knew that it was okay because the Holy Spirit would come after him and remind him of everything uh, he had said to them. This was as if to say, I know that this is a lot to take in, but I've placed everything you need inside of you and just receive it. And we can take him at his word. There's a great example of this working as the Holy Spirit empowers. The apostle Peter was one of the disciples that was with Jesus in the upper room during this farewell discourse. And Peter is wondering where Jesus is going and, and why we, we can't come with him. And he tells Jesus that he would die for him. And then Jesus responds by predicting Peter's own denial of Jesus three times. And then if we cast our minds to Acts 4, this same Peter who did indeed, even after it was predicted, deny Jesus three times, now empowered by the Holy Spirit, this advocate boldly stands before the same people that he saw crucify Jesus and he identifies himself as a part of this same movement. What a transformation of Peter's fear and anxiety all in receiving the gift that Jesus gave. So we've been given an advocate, the Holy Spirit, to teach us all things and remind us of everything that Jesus has said to us. Now, if the spirit of Jesus uh, being given to us doesn't produce a sense of peace within us, Jesus goes on to say that he's giving us his very own peace. And this is the second gift in our text today. Verse 27 of chapter 14 says this, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now I want us to see two things related to Jesus' peace. The first is this. Jesus says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Jesus knows that the peace the, the, that the world offers us is, is often fickle and shallow. It's limited. In fact, the kind of peace that they were enjoying in, in Jesus' day was the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And this kind of peace was founded on Roman military power. It was funded by Roman taxation and was maintained by Roman soldiers. This was a far cry from the quiet strength of spirit that Jesus gives. I wonder what kind of peace do we get from the world? Peace while our particular political power uh, party is in power, while judges we're aligned with sit on the courts, Peace while having the job or house we want or a certain level of financial security. Jesus knew that even the rich and the powerful would struggle to find lasting peace. 
that any peace circumstantially based would ultimately come up short. And Jesus, on the other hand, offers a lasting peace from the deepest source, a peace that leads the disciples and us to this affirmation, if God is for us, who can be against us? And the disciples were going to need this in the days ahead. Jesus knew the events of the days ahead for his disciples, his impending betrayal and crucifixion, that they would soon find themselves locked in an upper room having just witnessed his death, wondering who might be coming for them next and when. They were full of fear and questions. And Jesus likewise knows the days ahead for us. Jesus knows every possibility uh, on the world stage, in, in our nation, in our families, in our bodies, in our own hearts. And he wants us to be well and whole and able to stand, so he gives us his very own peace. This was Jesus' last will and testament, so to speak. He had no money or no property to leave them as he left. But their spiritual inheritance and our spiritual inheritance is the very peace of Jesus, amen? And then he goes even further with these commands in verse 27. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. This command, do not be afraid, is is reiterated over and over again in the Bible, 70 times uh, in the NIV. But there's a beautiful thing happening here as, as Jesus speaks his peace over us. And it's the the second thing I want us to see about Jesus' peace. Jesus' words are performative, meaning they work what they say. Jesus gives us peace by supplying the means of peace, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus' words then, do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid, are not a command to go and do, but a blessing spoken over us. Jesus says, let it be so. So as you bring your anxious heart as I bring my anxious heart to Jesus today, wondering what we might need to do to fix things. The reality is all we need to do is open our hands and stretch them out and open our hearts and receive this blessing of peace, that Jesus has done the work. I wanna share with you our our portrait video for this week. It features Kristen Shimabukuro, who leads our Eastside Family Ministry. Kristen has experienced firsthand the trouble that the world can bring and the peace that Jesus offers. Let's watch this together. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Growing up, I really felt like I was loved and appreciated by those around me. I really experienced a great home life. We went on family vacations and everything seemed to be going fine. And then my junior year of high school, my dad had a massive stroke that resulted in his death. and. The relationship I had with my dad was such a strong bond. It was even harder to lose someone like that at that age. Depression is a very lofty word. It can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. But for me, depression uh, looked like loneliness, uh, longing for something more. I'm an introvert, but this was a different type of feeling of like, I just want to be alone and almost be caught and consumed by my emotion rather than expose myself to what was reality. Whatever was going through my mind, um, you're not good enough, you're not pretty enough, or I would never be like successful in life, or I should just think myself away to a place that is really dark and maybe I belong in that place and finding that voice that was the truth was really difficult. As I rode the waves of depression and anxiety, I felt comfort from God that I wanted other people to know about when they're facing difficult times in their life. There's a way out. God gives us that way out and we just have to 
learn to stop ourselves from getting in the way of that way and realize like this life was not meant to live alone. Um, it was meant to be in community. God's journeyed with me through so many different seasons and I have been given the opportunity to uh, walk alongside others in their seasons. And that just fills my heart with so much joy and I can remember being in a camp and just experiencing this kind of pure joy of like, I'm with these middle schoolers and I just had this impression upon my heart like Jesus was talking to me saying, uh, don't you love this? Like, why not join me in full-time ministry? That was a big pivotal moment in my life that I'll never forget. Today, that same experience of that joy that was felt in that moment has really carried me through to where I am today in ministry and serving at Eastside and just the kids that I get to hear laugh every Sunday and even the crying, like that's that too is part of God's mysterious being in this world. And I'm so blessed to be a part of that. That's well said, huh? Beautiful. Kristen isn't here with us today as she's uh, serving this morning on the east side, but I just want to give her a hand and just let heaven record our thanks to her for, for that. Like Kristen said, words like anxiety and depression do mean a lot of different things uh, to a lot of different people, uh, but there's this third gift that she speaks to so well uh, that, that all of us can receive no matter our particular uh, situation. That's the gift of friendship, uh, uh, of deep community, of sacrificial investment in our faith community. And I'll pause to say here, if you find yourself in need today of, of a spiritual friend, someone to walk with you in whatever season you find yourself in, I'd bring your attention to our Stephen ministry. These are compassionate and empathetic people, uh, women and men trained uh, to listen and be the presence of peace uh, with you. Uh, likewise, if you are this kind of person, if you love uh, to listen and walk with folks in whatever season they're in, uh, we're beginning the recruitment season for uh, Stephen's ministry next week, and it'll run through December and early January. Uh, Pastor Don would love to tell you about that, or any of our staff in the foyer uh, can connect you. So uh, let's consider this third gift together, that of friendship. In the next chapter, uh, still a part of this uh, same discourse in John 15, Jesus says this, starting in verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has, uh, has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now friendship plays out in two ways in this passage. The first is in love expressed through the laying down of our lives. That Jesus had in just instructed them uh, with this image of staying on the vine. He says, if you want to bear fruit, stick with me and stick together. And then he commands us to love one another, and not only that, but to lay down our lives. Now, most of us, thankfully, aren't offered a situation in life to literally trade our life for another. Most of us aren't going to be the opportunity, uh, given the opportunity to, to take a bullet or to push someone out of the way of a oncoming bus or something like that, but all of us are daily offered opportunities to lay down our rights, our resources, our positions of influence, our authority, to spend ourselves on behalf of others. And that's the beauty of, of service, that not everyone can lead in every season, but everyone can serve. Kristen told of the joy that came from serving even in the midst of her struggles. And Jesus is saying, if you love me, serve my friends, serve those around you. Uh, and if you find yourself today in a season of struggle and, and serving isn't a part of your journey, uh, of your road to recovery, I'd invite you uh, to reach out to one of our ministry leaders or pastors. Find a place uh, to begin to serve. One of the swords that we swing in the kingdom of God is that of service. That is, we present Jesus to the world. Jesus is saying, my friends love each other. Uh, they serve with their very lives. And now the second way that friendship is a gift offered to us is this invitation to know and to be about the master's business, the business of Jesus. 
John 15, 15, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Disciples would consider it a a privilege, an honor to follow Jesus, to take orders, to to be sent, to do what needed to be done. And I I think if we're honest, uh, we do too. Sometimes it might even be easier. Lord, tell me exactly what you want me to do. And yet, Jesus is inviting us in at a more intimate level. I want you to be my friends my confidants. I want you to know what I'm thinking about doing, what motivates me and why. Listen to this passage in Isaiah 42 from the message. Or it says, I am God. I have called you to live right and well. I have taken responsibility for you to keep you safe. I have set you among my people to bind them to me and provided you as a lighthouse to the nations to make a start at bringing people into the open, into light opening blind eyes, releasing prisoners from dungeons and emptying the dark prisons. I am God, that's my name. I'm announcing the new salvation work. Before it bursts on the scene, I'm telling you about it. I love that. Before it bursts on the scene, I'm telling you about it. The friends of God have early access to the business of God. You thought those like, Black Friday preview emails were exciting. This is, this is great. This makes me excited because when I'm scared, when I'm confused, when I'm bored, when I'm anxious, Jesus wants to bend my ear and whisper his plans. And he reminds me of the new reference point that he gave me when he called my name. So we get to be about the master's business. But we also, uh, we get to know it, but we also get to be about it. Now remember Simon, Peter, and Andrew, these first disciples called, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. I want to give you a new reference point, a new mission, uh, a a new identity uh, envisioned by and empowered by nothing less than my very spirit. Jesus says to us this morning, you want peace? He answers us with Matthew 6, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. All these things, what things? This was Jesus during the Sermon on the Mount. This is him, he says, therefore do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, what you will wear. He says, I take care of the, the birds and the flowers. Jesus was speaking to these basic provisions, to, to, to food and water and clothing. I think we've added a lot to that list over time. I've added a lot to that list over time. Homes, cars, savings, likes and followers, advanced degrees, vacations, Disney Plus. One of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's famous sayings, he's the, this is the patron saint of Bethany. Uh, <laughs> he says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And this is true, but I I often think followers of Jesus in the Western world, myself included, want to follow Jesus like we follow people on on, on social media. We love their stories. We'll check out their posts. We'll like them. Maybe we'll hit the share button from time to time. But it's all on our timing and our terms, and it's really in addition to our own agenda. I think we need to wake up to what it means to come and die. to to what it means to seek first the kingdom of God and then trust God for every provision thereafter. And this is a hard word, I know. And yet, Jesus is offering it as a gift. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. My my burden is is easy. My yoke is easy, my my burden is light. This is uh, the paradox of the kingdom. Now remember Peter, who by receiving the gift Jesus gave, moved from saying he would die, but then when actually faced with the opportunity, denied Jesus in fear. This same Peter moved from that fear and denial to bold proclamation and a real willingness to lay down his life. Whatever Peter thought he needed to do, whatever skill set or experience he thought he needed to acquire was found lacking as he received the gifts that Jesus gave and placed his trust in Jesus. Remember, Jesus' words are performative. They work what they say. Jesus provided the means of peace, the means of faith, the means of bold proclamation. And when we're scared, the courage 
to do it scared. This is the spirit of God within us. And I'll close with this. I was reminded recently that the Christian life is not about accumulation, but about excavation. That Kristen said God had a better way, and she didn't want to let herself get in the way of that way. I love that. But how do we do that? Psalm 139 says this, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The way to peace is through inviting God to to remove anything in the way of God's way. And we have a choice to make, to build God's kingdom or ours. And only one offers lasting peace, the peace that comes from trusting God with our life and being about his business. Kristen said at the end there, in the the midst of serving God at a camp, she heard God saying, don't you love this? Why not join me in full-time ministry? Jesus says, why not? Now, all of us hopefully understand that full-time ministry doesn't mean uh, in a church or a faith-based institution. It can. It does for me and it does for Kristen. And this doesn't mean that you work at Boeing or Amazon or Children's Hospital and you spend all day running secret Bible studies while the boss isn't looking. Like, let me know if you do that. Uh, No, full-time ministry includes you doing your actual job uh, to the glory of God, to the best of your ability with excellence, and then loving and serving everyone around you, often just with your very presence. We believe in the priesthood of all believers, so if you're following Jesus, you are in full-time ministry, no matter where your paycheck comes from. If you're in school, if you're working inside or outside the home, if you're looking for work, if you're retired, especially if you're retired, Jesus says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of people. As counterintuitive as it may seem to us, God is building his kingdom through through you and through me, but it's not through our hard work. It's through our continual posture of humbly but confidently receiving the gifts that God gives. And we've been given an advocate, we've been given Jesus' peace, and we've been given friendship. May we receive these well together as we present Jesus in our city, Amen? amen? Amen, let's pray together. God, we thank you for these moments of worship together, and uh, we're thankful um, that we have the opportunity uh, within these walls often to, to practice our faith. And Jesus, we know that sometimes it's, it's much easier to live things out in here and that out there in the distractions of, uh, of the world and, and all the opportunities uh, to be pulled in so many different directions. Uh, we confess that it's hard. And so we want to carry our Sunday into our Monday, and we want in these moments together to sing together what's true. We want to put you in your proper place. We want to receive the gifts that you give, the rest that you give. Jesus, we want to be encouraged uh, and inspired by images of of your kingdom and together around the throne of Jesus worshiping. Uh, So we pray these moments together now would be sweet, that you would move among us for your glory. We love you. Amen. Let's worship.